like sicker than you could ever believe. Hello, MTBR people again. It seems like just yesterday we were in the desert talking about bicycles. I may have had a negative impression of the desert or left you with the impression that I have a negative impression of the desert, because I don't. I love the desert. Maybe just not so much when there's a bike show in the desert. Anyway, we're here with syndicate rider Josh Bryceland. He has a Porsche 944 with a welded differential. I think that that is a clever investment. A lot of young downhillers. What kind of car does Sam Blankensop drive, you know? Something gay. What about Brooke McDonald? Does he even know how to drive? Um, Brooke actually had something with a weld he did for a bit. Oh, okay, good, um, good. In a state car. Young downhillers of the world, listen to this. Do not buy expensive, fancy cars, especially if you live in the north of England and the roads are wet and narrow and you're probably driving too fast and there's lots of stone walls and sheep. An expensive car will not help you. An expensive car will get written off just the same way that a cheap shitbox will. However, you can walk away from the cheap one. Without crying. Yes, without crying. This has been a public service announcement brought to you by Santa Cruz Bicycles and the Santa Cruz Syndicate. Anyway, we should probably talk about bikes. We're here talking about bikes. That's, that all got edited out, so we'll continue. Uh, we're gonna start with our bargain basement stuff. Anyway. No, no, stay there, stay there. Santa Cruz Superlight. Our single pivot bikes are what we started with. The Santa Cruz Tasman was the first bike we ever made in 1993. The pivot placement of that bike was basically the same as what we're running now. It has four inches of travel. It is probably the most copied single suspension design that's ever happened in the world. It works really well. Uh, it has stood the test of time and it still represents a very healthy bike in our lineup. Things have happened kind of quietly in the Superlight and the Heckler and the Juliana range over the last couple years, but there's been a lot of evolution that's gone on that we should probably talk about quickly. The Pivot hardware is now much like it is on our APP and VPP bikes where we have an oversized aluminum axle going into a really heavily shielded bearing here. The axle threads into the back side of the frame and then there's a collet washer, a conical uh, washer that locks into the head on this side. As you tighten it down, it spreads the head of the bolt open and then wedges it into the, into the swing arm. In the past, we used to use little pinch bolts to hold a smaller diameter axle closed. It worked, worked really well. This works better and it's sort of the trickle down, if you will, of what we've learned with our VPP bikes and a lot of research into pivot hardware on that. Our pivot hardware on all our bikes kicks the ass of most of the rest of the industry. They heard it here first. Prices went down on these bikes in the last year. Frame price now, $9.99 with shock. Uh, you can get a complete super light with a D kit, which, you know what? This might actually be a DXC super light. $14.99 out the door. Bam. And they say we're not affordable. So, super light, Juliana, Heckler, they all kind of roll that same way as far as pricing and options there. They're good. We eliminated gussets on the tubing over the last couple years. Uh, because of hydroforming of tubing, we're able to get more, uh, more complex internal frame shapes, get the same kind of strength, maybe even better strength than we were able to get out of gusseted tubes, but eliminate a couple mis uh, manufacturing processes, which is what allows us to be able to bring these bikes in at a more competitive price point. We're gonna move along to talk about the APP bikes. Look, sitting next to Josh Bryson, it's Greg Menard of the Santa Cruz Syndicate. Sick. Mine's a lot better. It's got tram, rock shocks. Oh, team player. Nicely done, see that? That's a pro, professional. On the professional, on the professional, all right. I, I still love riding my Giuliani, even though it's a woman's bike of the year. It's still a great bike. You're in touch with your feminine side? Exactly. Okay, good. Stop looking at me. Okay, come on, let's talk about bikes. Thanks, guys. All right, come over here. I'm pretty sure we went through this last year. I'm pretty sure we went through it last year. I'm pretty sure we went through it the year before as well. But, like any good class, you get a refresher. APP. Play on words, actual pivot point. I know that sounds kind of dumb. You know, we've got virtual pivot point bikes. APP came about because we're tired of having all these acronyms, but we still have to have an acronym. If I had to work for some other company where you've got to spit out three-word or three-letter acronyms for everything you do, I'd have killed myself a long time ago. 
What we were doing with APP was trying to create a more sophisticated shock behavior in a less expensive package. Our single pivot bikes are rad, like we were talking about the pivot before, it stood the test of time, the placement is, is pretty optimal for a single pivot in that it is very neutral in the middle and big rings and any sort of pedal induced characteristics that are introduced to it uh, in the granny ring end up tending to stiffen the suspension a little bit as opposed to making it squat. So even though there is some pedal activation, it is, it is minimal compared to what you may find on certain other single pivot designs and a lot of people actually like the way it works. Fuck. In the mid 90s people were trying to say that that kind of stuff was actually a selling point. Anyway, single pivot bikes are great, they're simple, they're durable, they're reliable, they last a long time, but there's still limits to what you can do with your shock behavior. So. The shock rate on a single pivot bike is usually pretty linear. That is the leverage that your suspension exerts upon the suspension, uh, the leverage that your swing arm can exert upon the shock is generally just kind of a linear thing like that. So it's up to your shock to do all of your small bump to large bump compliance. Air shocks have a little bit of a, a ramp up in them, a progression to their spring rate that can help with that, but still, what you end up with is you have sort of a limited range. You can set your single pivot suspension to work really well in small bumps or really well in big bumps, but trying to get it to run that, that wide range of shock absorption with the same sophistication that you can get from a multi-link bike is very difficult. So, we took what we learned on our VPP bikes, which we'll be talking about a little bit later, and applied the shock curve that we use on those bikes to a single pivot design, hence APP. And what that is is an enhanced shock rate. It's uh, falling at the beginning, well, left to right, which way do you guys read? It's a falling at the beginning to rising at the end of the rate. It's exactly the same shock rate curve that we have in our VPP bikes. The regressive falling early rate gives you really good small bump compliance. It makes the shock want to move out of the way of hits and react quicker to all sorts of trail impacts. And then as that negative to positive shift happens, as the shock rate begins to climb again, as you get towards bottom out, it helps you resist the bottoming out. Uh, it, it allows a relatively simple air shock, or coil shock for that matter, to withstand or to, to react effectively over a much wider range of conditions than you would normally have with a straight single pivot. It feels like there's more travel. That's kind of the, the one sentence catchword we use. So if you were to compare a, well this is a nickel, it's our five inch travel bike, but if you were to compare a butcher, our six inch travel bike, to a heckler, which is also a six inch travel bike, geometries between the two are very similar, made from just about the same kind of frame material, aluminum, hydroform tubing, way about the same. The butcher would feel like it has an extra inch or so of wheel travel compared to the heckler. It is a substantial improvement in bump quality over a single pivot that we offer and we're selling these things. They come in at price point $1,350 for frame and shock. Uh, complete bikes start at about $1,900 bucks, depending what kind of kit you have on them and go up to a lot more than that, several thousands of dollars. Alright, that's that. That's APP. Same pivot hardware as our single pivot bikes. Large oversized aluminum axles that thread into the frame on one side have the collet heads expanding in here on the other side to lock them in place. Really good cartridge bearing system. It's good stuff. Are you ready? All right, also new for this year, probably not that new. You guys have been taking pictures of it. Francis has had one for God knows how long. He's not letting other people ride it, I hear. The Blur TRC. We launched this back in late spring. We started shipping them in June, I think. Um, I've been told not to say this, it's the Four Cross Reborn. I'm not allowed to say that. A whole bunch of people who loved the Blur Four Cross that we had a long time ago. The Four Cross was this like four inch travel blur VPP bike that was really slack and had a really low bottom bracket and you could slap it into a turn super hard and people loved it, but no one ever bought it. Um, yeah, they loved it. but they, Still didn't, we were still like sitting on the things for years and years and years. I just, we couldn't scare them out of here. But everyone who did buy it loved it. And then said, so this is my favorite bike ever. It had, I think it had a VP free down tube on it. They weighed a ton. I mean, our frame was probably like eight pounds. They were really strong. They were designed for this slalomy four crossy world that as everyone else has since figured out, 
doesn't really exist outside of actual UCI 4-cross racing, and those guys all ride hardtails. So maybe we missed the market a little bit, but there was this core of people who had like a lock on the idea of it being a super aggressive trail bike. It was slack, so you could throw it down stuff. For people who several years ago were already ahead of the curve and learning how to corner bikes and actually get their weight forward on it, it was awesome, even though it was a tank and even though it never sold. Anyway, here we are, 2011, and our engineers were riding around on, in Santa Cruz on Blur XCs, but they were slapping like 140 forks and things on them because they liked the way that they handled when they were super slacked out going downhill. But that, of course, has other contingent stuff. It raises the bottom bracket up, it slacks the seat angle off. So essentially, this was sort of the melding of what we knew about that bike that we're not allowed to talk about in the past, and where we'd gone with like Nomads and LTs, and what also we had with the XC, where we had this, the XC was our first carbon fiber bike. It weighed four and a quarter to four and a half pounds, depending on size, with shock, and was rad is rad. It's even lighter now, the XC, in case you didn't notice, it's over there somewhere. It weighs four pounds with the shock now. Bonus. So, during that time, we figured what if we made something that was XC light, almost, but was getting more in time with the people who are really starting to, to throw their bikes down hills, even though they're really light bikes. It's like, so this is it, the TRC. Blur, trail, carbon. TR for trail, C for carbon. Uh, 68 degree head angle with a 120 fork on it. A low bottom bracket that given this time of year I should have memorized, but it's the trade show and you guys are like the fifth people I've talked to today about this. And I can't remember, but it's a low bottom bracket. And 73 degree seat angle and kind of a long top tube. Seat angle and top tube are a lot like what you have on the XC and the Tallboy. Head angle is not like you have on anything except maybe an LT, but an LT is designed around 150 fork with the same head angle. So if you put a 140 or 150 on this, you're looking at like a 67 or less degree head angle. It's relatively uh, slack, relatively. Last time I said it was slack, people got upset and said, they're slacker bikes, which there are. It's like a Banshee or something that's way slacker, but it's a super good aggressive terrain trail bike. For downhillers who want light cross-country bikes, it's probably, yeah, yeah, that's what we'll call it. It's the downhillers cross-country bike. No, that's dumb. It's, it's a really good bike for people who want a light bike that's capable of covering shit tons of ground and also devouring big, aggressive terrain. Frame plus shock, five pounds on the money, stupid light. You could build one of these up with a dropper post and pretty burly tires like high rollers and still have a sub 26 pound bike if you're using like XTR or XO or XX level componentry. So it's, it's light but super burly at the same time and it's rad. It's where trail bikes sort of should be going, I think. That's all we got. I'm tired.